This is Incredible Stories Podcast, Episode 35, Bloody Fingers, The Rojas Murders. Well, hello again, everyone. It's time for another Incredible Stories podcast. I'm Josh Virla, your Dactyl host, and thanks for being here. Today, let's talk about fingers, those dexterous digits on the ends of your hands known for having rings put upon them if someone likes it. Fingers are also good for pointing out blame. Or rather, perhaps ironically, they are good for determining one's own blame. I'm talking, of course, of fingerprinting, a ubiquitous technique used by police departments today, but at one time it was a cutting-edge theory looking for a break. And it got that break in 1892, which marked the first time fingerprinting was used to determine a criminal's guilt in the case of the Rojas murders. Here's what I know. Nicochia is a small port city just southwest of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Today, it has a population of about 90,000 people, and I couldn't find exact data for this city in the 1890s. The furthest back I could find was 1947, in which the city had a population of just under 18,000 people. So that gives you some idea of just how small it was. Take that back 50 plus years. So Nicochia was home to 27-year-old single mother of two, Francisca Rojas. And on the day of June 19th, 1892, Rojas returned home from what I assume was her normal day-to-day activities of running errands or tango dancing, which had just been invented in the 1880s, incidentally. But when she returned home, she found a horrible scene. And the scene and the events according to Rojas was as follows, as dictated by somebody... Come in! Ah, Jimmy, good. Do you have my donuts? No, Chief. I just finished interviewing Rojas on the events. Oh, what do you got then, Jimmy? Well, Miss Rojas returned home, and upon opening the door, she saw her neighbor, Pedro Ramon Velasquez, in the room. There was a scuffle that led to the cut on Rojas' neck. After attacking Rojas, Velasquez escaped through the open door. Stunned, Rojas looked inside further and found the bodies of her six-year-old son, Ponciano, and her four-year-old daughter, Teresa, laying on the floor, bloody and stabbed to death. Jesus, Jimmy. I've seen a lot of in my time in the force, but this... I know, Chief. I know. Don't worry, we'll get that bastard. Speaking of getting, seriously, where are my donuts? Ah... <sighs> So, that's pretty much the account of what happened according to Miss Rojas, although I will note that there were some discrepancies in the gender of the youngest child from what I could research. Some sources state she had two sons, some a son and a daughter. So in this story, I went with this son and daughter version. But Velasquez was a neighbor who apparently had a romantic interest in Rojas. But Rojas was not so much interested in him and rejected his advances just a few hours prior to the murders happening. So the local police had a witness and a motive and brought Velazquez in for questioning. Now you can imagine of course Velazquez didn't admit to murdering the kids, go figure. So the police began some in-depth interrogation, aka torture methods. And they did this in order to get a confession out of Velasquez. They even had a creative method to get a confession. And this method involved tying the children's dead bodies to Velasquez overnight. That is terrifying. But still no confession though. Damn Velasquez, you're a hard nut to crack. So the police said, okay, no problem, and tortured him for another week. 
and I'm not sure on the exact techniques they used, but I would assume that whips might have been used, maybe even electro torture. That was all the rage back then. Also, water torture seemed to be pretty popular in the 1890s, so that's a possibility. And water torture is strapping down a torturee, then slowly dripping water on their forehead. Apparently, this makes one insane. I think the Mythbusters did an episode about this. If I can find the clip, I'll link it in the show notes. But anyway, the police weren't making any headway into the case, so they needed help. By this time, the report of the murder had made its way to La Plata, the provincial capital. And on July 8th, the big city sent in police inspector Eduardo Alvarez to help. So Alvarez shows up and the local police are clueless as far as leads. They have no idea where to go next. They have two dead bodies, one witness statement, one suspect, and no confessions. So Alvarez, being a big time city police guy, worked it out. He interviewed Velazquez, you know, instead of torturing him. And fairly quickly, he realized that Velazquez had a solid alibi. You see, Velazquez had been out with several friends during the time of the murder. And I assume they were out doing Argentina-y things like playing soccer or looking for the extinct ground sloth, which may be an episode in the future sometime, so keep a lookout. Okay, Mr. Velazquez, you're free to go, but we're keeping an eye on you. So Alvarez then interviews some more people and finds this juicy tidbit of information. Apparently, Rojas had a boyfriend who was overheard saying something like, quote, I'd marry Rojas, except for those two brats. Ooh, interesting. And also, her boyfriend sounds like he might be hiding a lucky stash of gold. Now, Alvarez revisited the site and noticed a bloody thumbprint on the bedroom doorframe. And Alvarez had recently been trained by Juan Vucetich. I hope I'm saying that correctly. I'm gonna go with Vucetich. So Vucetich trained Alvarez in fingerprinting and thought this might be a good time to look into the finger of the matter. But before I go into that, let me tell you a bit about Juan Vucetich. He was the man in charge of criminal identification and had been developing a system of comparing fingerprints so he could ID individuals. Police forensics was pretty limited for the time, and the prevalent method for identifying criminals was a system called the Bertolone system, which identified people by recording their body measurements, physical descriptions, and photographing them. As you can imagine, this method was not very accurate and costly. The idea of fingerprinting as a means for identification had been around for a while, and the ancient Babylonians, Chinese, and Egyptians even used fingerprints pressed in clay, possibly as a form of identification. But up to this point in the early 1890s, fingerprinting to ID criminals was merely a more mm, sci-fi concept. In fact, Mark Twain wrote about using fingerprints to ID a murderer in the story Life on the Mississippi in 1883. My man Vucetich, however, took the fictional concept of using fingerprints to ID criminals and made it ready for prime time. Vucetich called his newly developed method Ichnophalangeometrica, which is Greek for finger sign measurement. Okay, back to Alvarez. So upon finding the bloody fingerprint on the door, Alvarez took the piece of the door containing the fingerprint and sent it to Vucetich for analysis. He then requested that Miss Rojas be fingerprinted and then her prints along with Velazquez's were also sent back to Vucetich so he could compare the two along with the bloody door print. Now upon examination, it was found that the bloody fingerprint didn't match Velazquez, so he was cleared. But it did match Rojas! So the police brought this evidence to Rojas and said something like, uh, lady, we got a match of your fingerprints with the bloody print on the door. It's pretty obvious you murdered your own children. And they were right. Rojas broke down and confessed to killing her kids. No torture necessary. Wait a minute, Josh. Couldn't that just have been from her bloody hands after she found her kids' bodies when she tried to hold them and or revive them? And what about the cut on her neck? 
Why would she have done this? Well, Rojas, during the initial questioning of what happened, explicitly stated when she found the dead bodies of her children, she did not touch them. And after she admitted to the murder, she said that she also cut her own neck as a way to frame her neighbor Velazquez, whom she didn't like because he wanted to get with her. But couldn't that have just been her own blood on the door, then you ask? Possibly. But again, she admitted to murdering the kids too. As for the why, well, remember I mentioned earlier her boyfriend had been overheard saying he would have married Rojas if it weren't for her bratty kids? Apparently Rojas desperately wanted to be with her boyfriend in an official way and thought the best way to do that was to eliminate the thing keeping them from being together. And that of course was her children, which he was no fan of. So Rojas was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. But along with being a horrible person, Rojas will also go down in history as being the first person to be found guilty of a crime through fingerprint evidence. And now you know what I know. Fingerprinting is by far one of the most used methods of forensic identification used in most police departments the world over. But the legacy of fingerprints doesn't just stop at crime and police work. It's used today in biometric identification where a person's unique physical traits can be used to identify them for access into things like computers, security systems, etc. If not for fingerprinting, the plots of many CSI and Law & Order shows would be greatly different. But for all the great applications and evidence of fingerprinting being unique to individuals, consider this. The possibility of someone having the exact same fingerprints as you is around 1 in 64 billion. And that's in terms of people, not individual fingers. And although very low, the false negative rate, and that's when someone examining fingerprints says that the two fingerprints don't match when they do, is dependent upon human interpretation. Also, the false positive rate is very small as well, but not totally zero. Basically, humans make mistakes, and prints from crime scenes can be smudged or can be incomplete. As an example, this occurred when a U.S. lawyer named Brandon Mayfield was identified by the FBI as a suspect in the 2005 Madrid bombings. He was, of course, wrongfully identified based on only partial prints left at the scene. The authorities in Spain did, however, eventually get the right man, and that man's name was, and I'll probably butcher this terribly, Dewad Ohinane. He was from Algeria. But the bottom line is, despite its flaws, if you commit a crime and your fingerprints are there, you're probably gonna get caught. But now for something that never gives you a false reading, the haiku! My sneaky fingers. I'd like to see you catch me. What? You have my prints? And that's all the time this week, guys. Check out our main site for other stories on IncredibleStoriesPodcast.com. Send me an email or haiku. All the information is on the website. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at IncredPod. Rate us on iTunes and peep us out on YouTube and Stitcher. For Incredible Stories Podcast, I'm Josh, and remember, the journey of a thousand tales begins with the first word. Jesus.